to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh, yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily, there's more to you than you think. Come on, my friend. Welcome. Thank you, Aubrey. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure to get to spend time with you. And, and this book that you wrote has been one of the most significant books I've ever read in my life, if not the most significant. And I'm sure we'll cover a lot of stuff in it. But I want to start off, the book is called Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. I want to start off by asking you, when was the first moment where you realized that you didn't love yourself? You know, it's funny. I never used to think about the fact about loving myself. I, I just wasn't that guy. Yeah. Uh, no, I was not that guy. Uh, the thing about loving myself <clears throat> actually came when I had rock bottom. And I really had bottom. And it was a desperate attempt to save myself. And you and I talked about this, the power of commitment. How I really fundamentally believe in the power of commitment and making commitments to yourself. You got to keep them. And in this desperate moment, I, I made this vow to myself. But how did you even know that the, that the rock bottom was caused because you didn't love yourself? I didn't. You didn't. I was at bottom, like my company had fallen apart. I lost everything. I was really sick. I was miserable. I was depressed. And I was just like one, one morning or one night, I remember, it was dark. I remember that, and, you know, metaphorically and externally. The dark night yeah. of the soul, perhaps? And I just got in my bed and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Uh -huh. I'm either going to get out of this or die trying. And I walked over to my journal and I wrote, grabbed my pen and I wrote, a, I, I knew I had to make a vow to myself to get out of this. I didn't know what. Mm. And I just sat down and I wrote, and I, 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 I vowed to, it was freehand, right? I vowed to love myself. And I, you know, it was a longer vow, but it, it was about loving myself. Where that came from, I had no idea. I still don't. It was a primal, it was a pure primal vow. It came from like a deep place of literally I was trying to save myself. And when I realized that, what I'd done, I was like, okay, I don't know how to do that. Mm. And I got to figure out because I made a commitment to myself and, and a vow to yourself is a sacred act. Yep. You know, you, you do that, you keep it and life will change. And I had to figure out how to do it. And I knew I had to work on my internal self. It wasn't about taking bubble baths and, you know, like... <laughs> right, that's what a lot of people think. They're <laughs> yeah, like, ah, yeah. just get a massage, take a vacation. And that's nice. It's self-care. It's self-care. Yeah. It's not self-love. There's no, a difference. Self-love is... It's related, but it's different. It's, a com it's an internal thing. It's a mindset. It's where you... It's a belief. It's a rock-solid belief where your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions rise from. If they, if they rise from there, then your life rises from there. Obviously, this I've learned after the fact. I didn't know right. in the moment... Right, Because in the moment, it was either, I mean, you talk about in the book, you talk about you were having thoughts about your friend's handgun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, it was that serious, that yeah. rock bottom. And I think for most of us, I think those thoughts have flashed through our head, you know, a few times at different rock bottom points of our life, like maybe just hit the reset button. But the other option was to do something equally drastic, but positive to save yourself. And then yeah. that equally drastic, but positive was that vow to love yourself but i think it's really very interesting that you actually came to that conclusion which i believe is actually the best solution to most rock bottom situations it really is you know look we're, we're human beings right and fundamentally like the mind we're stuck with the human mind this this monkey brain that runs around on this untamed horse right the details differ but i think the core is the same and fundamentally it's 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 fear and love you know, mm. the cliche that we hear about, and you and I talked about this, I had a literal near-death experience, you know, like a little over two months ago, and that's mm -hmm. what I experienced because it was trauma. It was like the only things that came up were fear and love, fear and love. And those are the primary motivators. And those are the two opposing forces of the universe, really, yeah. in some ways, you know. And what I've also learned is like, look, you can't fight fear. You know, like fear, you know, it's, it's a concept that I've, I've learned is that, you know, light and darkness like you can't fight darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. So what you do is you work on the light, you bring the light in and that takes away the darkness. Yeah. And so that's something I actually really learned on my, on my own and trying to save myself 
was if I worked on the light, it would take care of the rest. Mm. And that's love. Love is ultimately light. Like when you when you feel love, you feel light. There's a there's a there's a lightness inside, you know, for lack of a better word. But uh, it's a fundamental truth. It is. And do you think so? You know, you weren't coming in without any knowledge of this subject because you, as we talked about yesterday, you've been engaged with ayahuasca since 2003. Yeah. Which was, yeah. I mean, I thought I was early in 2010, <laughs> but 2003 was way early. And I know during those experiences, you experience, you know, certain aspects of that self-love or the personal power, which is something we talked about, which is related because it's the authenticity of your true self. But so that, do you think that colored and maybe gave you maybe some of the clues as to how you were going to get out of your rock bottom situation? Possibly, because look, all these things, you know, especially things like ayahuasca, they change things inside of us. Mm -hmm. You know, where did it come from to make a vow to love myself, really? That I've never been able to figure it out. All I know is it came from somewhere deep, deep, deep within. So it was pure. Yeah. But, you know, our experiences, uh, you know, you know ca cause cascade effect on our lives. So, but I'm sure it did, if I yeah. think about it. And actually, <clears throat> I'd taken a long break from ayahuasca at that period. Maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> 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 you know, if you think about it, uh -huh. I probably would have made different decisions in my business, honestly, if I think about it. Because one great thing ayahuasca does is it shows me my own inner bullshit. Yep. Right. And if I had just seen that as a CEO, I would have made better choices. Nothing can hold uh nothing can hold us accountable like the plants can hold us accountable. True. Because you can bullshit everybody yeah, else yeah. but yourself. Yeah. And the plants bring that aspect of yourself that will call you on all of your oh, bullshit. In your face. <laughs> you know, and it, it will not let you stop looking at it until you're done accepting it. I remember one journey I did at at Alaska when I was like in the end, I was like, okay, okay, I get it. Just stop. I get it. Just stop. I get it. It just doesn't yeah. stop, right? Yeah. But it's the biggest gift you can give yourself is to face your own bullshit and move it. Because we're we're the ones who we're responsible for it all. Sure. You know, that's another another thing I've learned you know, we've learned we were talking about this last night at dinner, is like we're responsible for it all. Because we're the only ones we control. That yeah. is such a powerful thing, and I want to get back to that because yeah. I think that's a really important, uh, really important idea. Uh, but I just want to stick with the thread of okay, so you make the vow, and yeah. this is something that you actually talk about as like one of the first steps in the process. And I think first, though, before you even make the vow, I think we got to get to the point of identifying the problem because for me, I can look at myself, and people would ask me because I'm in this in this field where people are talking about self love and and the different you know utilization of that and how much you love yourself and people would ask me and i'm like yeah i love myself i'm good but i wasn't i was blind to the um, to actually how much i was relying on external sources for my own self-love even with all the work i've done even with all the plant medicines i was still kind of blind to that and so i, I think i guess the first place i'd like to go is to help people kind of recognize and realize whether they may or may not have an issue with self-love in the first place. Like the reason some people listening might be like, yeah, I love myself. Like I did. I, that was me all confident, overconfident. Like, yeah, I love myself, whatever. It's just all this external stuff that's the problem. It's not me. I mean, I'm good. But like if all this other stuff was fixed, mm -hmm. then my life would be fucking totally great. Mm -hmm. You know, but really it, it was all it was all me. So do you have advice for somebody to kind of track and, and realize whether they could use more self-love well first who of us couldn't who <laughs> that's true <laughs> i mean we're human beings right um who of us couldn't and look one thing is like some people confuse with narcissism loving yourself is not narcissism like i've met a few narcissists in my life and they're actually the opposite of loving themselves yeah you can tell it's you almost know. a response to lack of lack of yeah. self love because it's the need to have other attention, affection, appreciation. It's it's actually on the far scale of the conditional love paradigm where they have to show something in order to receive love from some other source, whether that's some aspect of their mind or some aspect of the collective. Well, controlling others, controlling so, others. I've it's it's that the opposite of yeah. actually the abundance of self love, which comes in that very soft and humble authentic way it, you know it's a state of being yeah and and you arise from there you know it's we, we all have like certain set points in our state of being where we just naturally default to you know as we go through the day we go through our lives and so it's not about being selfish it's not about being narcissistic it's not about um you know 
what it is is a state of being where your choices and your thoughts and your feelings arise from. That's what I've discovered for, my, for myself. Mm -hmm. The more I work on it, the more I do it, the more I notice I just make better choices. I'm, it's my state of mind. It's who I am inside. You know, it's how I feel, how I look at the world. Where my, do my thoughts go towards gratitude naturally? Do they go towards feeling blessed naturally? Do they just like feel love for others naturally? That's a state of love. And it's actually, it's, it's a beautiful place to be inside. The most beautiful. Yeah. And it's a very simple place. It's a very natural place. But funny enough, it took me a good amount of work to get there. <laughs> that's, the, that's the funny thing about all of these mystical truths. Simple. But, but require a deep commitment and a lot of work to get there. And stripping away, right? Yeah. And what I learned was, at least for myself, because, you know, look, I, come, I'm, I consider myself a doer. I don't want to stay in theory, and especially when I came up with this, it was to save myself. It was like, I didn't want to unpack old stuff. I didn't want to go see where and why. I didn't care about the why. Mm. I just wanted to care about what fixes this. Yeah, and so instead of asking, why don't I love myself? Just say, yeah, fuck that. Fuck. Let's just... I'm going to love myself. Yeah, literally. You decide and you go in. You commit <laughs> and you do it. You commit and you do the work. Yeah. That's literally the secret of life anyway. You commit, you do the work. Yeah. You know, and especially with the inner stuff. You commit, you do the work. Like this amazing gym you have here, which I'm in love with. It. Like I'm going to move here <laughs> just to go work out here, right? I kid you not. I hope and, you do. Oh my God. And But if you want to be in shape, you don't, you don't go to like work out like once a week or once a month or whatever. You commit, you do the work. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be healthy, you eat healthy, you commit, you do the work, you do it consistently. Your mind, your inner self, which is the ultimate thing, which is what we got, which everything rises from, to make that better, you commit, you do the work. But no one teaches us that. No one taught me that, right? We weren't taught this in school or college. And, you know, my upbringing was quite the opposite of it. Yeah. You know, and so it was a matter of you do it for yourself. And the great thing is um, the, hu the human mind, the inside is so malleable. It's such a beautiful thing that we've been, this gift of whoever this, this being is inside is such a beautiful gift that you can craft this being to who you want it to be, to who you want to be. And it's really easy, actually. It's very simple. There's no like long, complicated programs or like rituals or whatever, just very simple things you have to do inside and you start to shift. And then when you start to shift, life starts to shift. Yeah. That's just a fundamental truth I've learned. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Absolutely, that's absolutely the case. So let's talk about this then. So you, you started with that vow and then you, were, you had to figure out, all right, now how do I do this? How do I do this in the most simple, effective way possible that's, that I can replicate? And you came up with a formula. And I think that's why I say, you know, I've read a lot of great books on love, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, Mastery mm -hmm. of Love, and a variety of different things that really talk about the importance of loving yourself. But nobody really has a pragmatic, practical manual about, okay, it's the most important thing, and here's how you do it. And that was the thing that you tasked yourself with. It was like, okay, how do you do this? You start with a vow, right? That was step one. Commitment. Commitment. Commitment to self. And then from there, where do you go? You know, honestly, I felt like at that time, I remember I was like, I was in my apartment and um, I felt like a crazy man, man. I was just trying everything in my head because I was like, <laughs> okay, I can't do this from the outside because I feel miserable on the inside. So I, you know, I was like, okay, I feel miserable on the inside. What's going to make that better? What's going to shift that? And I was trying all sorts of crazy things. I was like, and I stumbled upon... What is the simplest thing? And I remember I was quite sick at the time. What is the simplest thing I can do? Which is, I'm just going to start telling myself this and see what happens there. So I just started repeating it to myself. I love myself. I love myself. And I just started doing it. And almost because I had nothing else to do, nothing else while I was trying to figure out. And I noticed it started to shift my thoughts. What it, first of all, what it did was it stopped the other thoughts. Yeah. You know, your mind focuses on one thing at a time. It's a horse. You guide it to where you want it to go. Yeah. And... <clears throat> I noticed after a few days, something in me started to shift a bit. Like it was actually started to run on its own a little. And then I, I tricked it. I added feeling to it where I just like, and look, we can make ourselves feel anything we want. And that was the game changer. Mm. I started adding feel. I just used to breathe in deep and feel it inside because why not? I had nothing to lose, you know? That's something that's, so telling yourself and i think you do a really good job in the book you talk about the taking the breaths where in every inhale you say i love myself right 
And I think a really valuable part of the book that you say is maybe when you first start telling yourself that, you don't really believe it and it's really hard to feel it. And I think that takes some of the pressure yeah. off. Just like, doesn't matter. Just say it. For now, just say it. It's going to get really powerful when you can add the feeling to it. But maybe you're not able to right off the bat. Maybe you just need to start taking a few of those first layers off, you know, by just, or, or, or you know, patterning that first part of the groove is really the mm -hmm. metaphor you use. The first few scratches by just saying the words. And then from there, then you can try to add the feeling with it, which will really start to deepen the groove. Yeah, it's a step-by-step -step thing. And I mm -hmm. realize that because if you do it too fast, your mind, um, it'll it'll fight back. These, all these old patterns and like the old demons will come up. So the best thing is do it just step-by-step. -step. You deepen the groove, you feel it, then you add feel, you know, you feel that, oh, something's shifting, then you add the next. Then you, and it's very gentle, yeah. you know? And it's all you're doing is, you know, the mind's all over the place all during the day anyway. You're just like shifting it, training it to go a certain way. So I started doing that. And then I was doing um, it all sorts of things. I was doing it outside. I was doing my head. I was doing all these, you know, trying other variations, you know, and just I kept on coming back to this simple one, just making myself feel love for myself, adding a feeling of light coming in as I did that with the breath. And then when I breathe out, naturally I noticed gratitude. I would start feeling grateful. You know, that came out of nowhere. That became like the natural response from being in that state, you know, which is where the power comes from. You don't have to make yourself feel all these other things. If you start to feel love for yourself, the other things just naturally rise on their own. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I started meditating and I'm quite honestly quite lazy about meditating. So I kind of like hacked it a bit where I just would listen to one song, uh, one particular song, which is a classical piece of music. And it was seven minutes long, and I would just made, do the same thing, but while listening to the, medita to the song and meditating, and I noticed that after maybe about a week or so, the moment I put the song on, my mind would go into that state. I was just anchoring yeah. the state of mind to that music. So I made that a practice, added that in. Then another thing was I was doing in front of the mirror, and I realized if I looked in my left eye and I did it loud, it was powerful. So these, so this yeah. is the escalation of this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just keep taking yeah, this yeah, yeah. really slow. It. Because one of the th other things you mentioned is that as you do these 10 breaths, let's just say we're starting out, we're at the basic level. And honestly, even me, like I started out at the basic level where really pretty much I could only say it. You know, I was at kind of a really low point, you know, and this was not long ago when I actually recognized that I was really deeply reliant on external sources for my self-love. And I kind of pushed away all of my other external sources. I declared my celibacy and I went into this kind of isolation mode where I wasn't allowing myself to get any external validation. And then I hit a real low point. You know, it wasn't quite as dark night of the soul as some of the places that you talk about in the book, but it was at a place where my self-love was really low. And I remember just going through, just saying it like, like you recommend, but also recognizing that sometimes I would get to like six breaths of I love myself and my mind would just wander off into some other direction. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, one of the parts I really appreciated that you said is like, even if it takes you 10 attempts to get to 10 breaths, you know, so you end up taking 100 breaths to get a sequential 10 breaths saying, I love myself. Like that's a little, little victory in and of itself. And then you add, then you add the feeling in there. But I, I really would encourage people to just try it. You know, just to like try to get through that 10 breaths where on every inhale you love yourself. Bonus points if you can really start to feel it or if you can visualize, as you said, the light coming through because those are, that's going to deepen the breaths. And then there's even an escalation where you talk about later, which is saying, you know, thank you mm -hmm. on the exhale of the breath. But and I love how you put it, like, don't worry about jumping ahead to that. Some of you might want to, but that will actually challenge the mind even more so just like, just start with the 10, like start there and then see if you can make it through the 10 and see how many times a day you can do that and with that commitment. And then, then we'll go deeper into the, what you do in the meditation in the mirror, because these are all like escalations. And that's, I think the beauty of this method is you're, you're just built, it's just building blocks. One on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, deepening, deepening, deepening the group. You really got it. You really got what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think everybody will who who 
who reads this. That's why that's why I think it's so important because it's acknowledging it's not it's not supposing that somebody's just going to get it. Like you could all suppose say, okay, take ten breaths. And on every inhale, say, I love myself and feel it to the fullest. And on every exhale, say, thank you and feel gratitude to the fullest. And just assume that people are going to be able to do that. I wasn't able to do that. I wasn't able to do that. <laughs> right? So, right? Like, so yeah. what, what are yeah. you, how, why would you put that in a book? You know, like just telling people and making that assumption because it's not real. Like it's, this is simple, but requires like work and practice and you'll get better at it. And some days you'll find it easier than others. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah. You know, the mind is strong. You know, the training of the mind, the old, old, the old self is strong and it'll kick in. And it's just doing the work, getting mm-hmm. up and doing the work and doing the work. And it compounds, man. It really compounds. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. And when you started noticing and doing it on its own, when you just walk around feeling it, that's a beautiful place to be. Mm. It arises spontaneously out of your being because you've started to pattern it. And what you talk about, you talk about cutting a groove so deep that all the other mental loops and mental patterns, instead of defaulting to your normal, you know, mild self-loathing or requests for validation from other sorts, if you cut that self-love channel so deep inside your psyche, naturally by default, all of your other thought patterns will flow back into that current. And I thought, wow, what a great metaphor for how to train the mind. You know, the neurons that fire together, wire together, right? Something that Joe Dispenza yeah. talks about a lot and you mentioned here as well. Like, it's a, that's a fact. And so as you're forming these cognitive patterns that you could call, imagine like a groove, that will become your default. And then when that becomes your default, you're going to be a happy person. <laughs> Naturally. Naturally. Yeah, and in the, even the more so than happiness, like I don't run around and say, oh, like I don't run around like a crazy happy guy, but I run around solid. Yeah. It's, it's more of a solidness you get, Yeah, you know, which is actually even better, I'd say. I mean, you get happy and, and, and still you get sad, like life happens. Of course. Right? We're human beings. We don't become robots, right? But there's a solidness that comes. That's a state that arises from within that, and it arises from you. It's yours. No one gave this to you. You created this for yourself. And so no one can take this away from you. Only you can give it away. And you can take it and you can create it again and again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you know, I've like lost it. You know, I've completely let go and, you know, like let life get the better on me. But I know where to go back and I've gone back and each time it works. Mm -hmm. I've almost gone back in some ways. I'm a little, I don't know (laughs) if it's a little crazy, but I've gone back to see, does this work? I have to mm-hmm. convince, I want to convince myself again, you know, and I do it and it works every time. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's so simple too. Yeah. Like I wouldn't find a better solution because I try other things as well. And, and this is just, and I don't think this is anything, this is, there's nothing rocket science here. You know, I think if it was rocket science, uh, I wouldn't have gotten it. This was just like <laughs> one man trying to save himself and he figured out a way and he shares it, shared it with others. And you know what? It worked for them. Why? Because we're human beings. Mm. Same human mind, right? When you talk about solidity and that sense of equanimity and that sense of like peace and balance, you know, which is I think actually a, a better description of the end goal of the state, this kind of state of being full yeah, and, and, and buffered from the storms. But you have some other tools in here to talk about dealing with these, you know, the times when things get turbulent. And so you have a question that you encourage people to ask themselves, you know, in this, in a challenging state. So if you could share that, I think that'd be great. Yeah. This question came from after I was getting better, but then I was like interacting with other people and things were, you know, life was happening and something's good, something's not so good. And I would ask myself, you know, in the middle of a conversation, middle of something that I wasn't happy about, if I loved myself, what would I do? Now, the key point being if, because it's not like I have, I'm loving myself 100% of the time, or even let's assume I'm loving myself 1% of the time. If. So anyone can answer an if question. When you ask your mind that, it'll give you the answer. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So then what you can do is then make the choice, what you want to do internally and externally. You know, and it's a very powerful, I think course, asking yourself questions in the moment is one of the best things we can do. Sure, it's a pattern and, interrupt. It's a great pattern interrupt, especially if you take one cushion and make that your pattern interrupt. So you got to find the cushion that you know is going to serve you in every situation. And for me, that, that was this question. 
you know, I, I can ask myself before I sit down to eat. I can ask myself if I don't feel like going to the gym. I can ask myself if I'm in a conversation with someone. It's a difficult conversation. I can ask myself if I'm just feeling crappy about myself and ask myself if I love myself, what would I do? Well, I would do the practice. You mm-hmm. know, if I wanted to eat and eat, if I love myself, what would I do? I would choose a healthier option. It's a very, very simple question, but it's, it's, it works beautifully. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because of the if yeah. part. Yeah, because then it can, you can output a really clear answer without binding yourself. You can still choose another thing. Conscious but at least choice. It's a conscious choice. Yeah. But So if I love myself, would I allow myself to experience this is one thing. So I think about moments where I've gotten really angry and upset or, or in, a, in a relationship situation, right? If I would have had the wherewithal and the knowledge to ask that question, if I loved myself truly and deeply... Mm. Would I allow myself to experience this? Would I allow myself to express this level of anger? There's no way my mind could have wiggled out. I mean, I'm squirmy. I mean, I'll wiggle. We all I'll, are, man. I'll wiggle. We all are. But if you ask that question, if I love myself truly and deeply, would I allow myself to experience this and express myself in this way? The answer would unequivocally be no. And then I have to deal with that. Yeah. I can either be like, well, fuck it. And then just do the stuff bad and do the stuff I don't, I shouldn't be doing anyways. Or I have to go, okay, well, now that I know that, let's take a moment here. And then, like you said, maybe go back to the practice, that simple practice of, all right, well, I'm clearly, if I love myself, I wouldn't be doing this. So let me go back to my self love practice. Let me just take 10 breaths, 10 breaths and say, I love myself. And then see how I'm going to change my behavior, change my pattern. Because that's the thing, like so many people were talking about, how do you deal with anger? How do you deal? This is like one of the most elegant solutions to dealing with an emotional response that I've ever heard. Because it's true. You ask yourself this if question, and then if the answer says you would be doing something different, then you have what you do. And it's not like some extravagant thing. You need to go wherever you can just say, hey, I'd like to take a moment and take your 10 breaths. And you know, you start doing them just automatically. You start doing them yep. in a conversation. Yeah. You know, because you're breathing whether you want to or not. And, yeah. And you and don't you need want to say it out loud. So yeah. you're saying yeah. it in your head. So you could be doing this the whole time as the trigger is approaching, as that emotional challenge is coming. Oh, I feel you. I see you coming there for me. I see you coming to twerk all those different knobs that are going to trigger all the different things that are going to get me fired up. I see it coming. Let me start the breaths now. Yeah. I do that anytime, like if I feel nervous about something. You know, mm-hmm. if I go give a talk before I go on stage, I just get quiet. I'll do them solid after 10 and go on stage. Mm-hmm. It works. It works. It just works. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's one of those things. Like, so you build the foundation and then all of these other things can default to the foundation. And again, like you said, with food or working out, like if I really love myself, would I work out today? Well, the answer could actually be yes or no. Sure. Because you could be so tired that actually resting would be better, but you might have some egoic need to look a certain way. So you might be pushing yourself in the gym. So the answer to that question might be, no, if you loved yourself, you'd go home and rest. Or it could be, yeah, if you loved yourself, you'd get your ass in the gym. You know, it could be either one of those, but you can ask that un- impartial question. It's being real with yourself. It's being real. Yeah. 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 That's the best gift you can give yourself, man. You know, be real with yourself in this stuff. Yeah, because I think at least for my mind, it creates all these beautiful, intricate stories, justifying everything that's not good for me. <laughs> <You know>? Oh yeah, <laughs> right? oh yeah. And so this just cuts right through all that. Yeah, you know that's what it does, and that's what we talked about. That's what plant medicine does just cuts right through all of it in your face, and you just got to deal with it. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about. I think we covered the ten breaths. Let's talk a little bit more about the. Um, the mirror practice and the meditation practice Mm -hmm. and specifically so you're saying for the meditation practice you pick a seven minute song and you don't particularly link it to the breaths it's more about the feeling they're just trying to really feel that love for yourself is that the goal of the meditation well the song just that i pick happened to be seven minutes long you know it could be however long you want right it's just it's just a focused short amount of time and you're anchoring the state you're creating inside to that music so when you put the music on Bam, after a while you go to that state. It's very simple, you know? So, because a lot of people with meditation, your mind's running around, you're trying to figure out what to do. Well, this actually gets you where you need to go very fast. 
And then all you're doing, you're basically doing what we did with the mental loop. You're breathing in love. You're breathing out gratitude. You're breathing in light. You're breathing out gratitude. That's it. Mm-hmm. To a to the state, to the song, eyes closed, just feeling it, feeling it, feeling it, layering it in, layering it in. And this is one I've noticed. You may not feel like the big effects right away, but this one has has an effect on your life. That's the only way I can say it. If you were to ask me if there was one thing I would do consistently, it would be this. Mm. There's something about that focus short time of layering it in, layering it in, layering it in that just adds up over time. Yeah. yeah. And I came up with it because I didn't have the patience for meditation. <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't want to sit around for two hours and just like watch my, watch my breath. I get, you know, like I get, I go nuts. So right. I, I was like, well, let me try to this piece of music that I liked. And I just noticed it worked. So I stayed with it. In fact, uh, I still do it. You know, it's, uh, <clears throat> I could do it on a flight. I could do it anywhere. You just put on your headphones and you put on that piece of music and boom, off you go. Yeah. I took a little time to find my song and I've got it now. I, there's actually two that are kind of still in the running. I haven't fully decided which one yet, but I've been starting to practice it and it's, it's powerful. But again, your mind will try and wander and go away from it, but it's just that discipline of, you know, I think it's another thing that I recently was at that workshop with Dispenza. So I got a lot of his words in my head at the moment, but he says, any time in meditation, you're going to come up against yourself. And mm. when you come up against yourself, the quality of your life and the quality of your practice is what you do when you come up against yourself. It's not the fact that you come up against yourself because you're going to. So even in that meditation, your mind's going to wander. It's going to draw you to business or sex or some other thing that your mind wants to default and deviate you from. And that's you coming up against yourself. And at that moment you come up against yourself, you go, oh, okay, hello, mind. Like, here you are, I see you. And I'm going to go back to my practice now because I'm in control. I, you know, I am, Mm -hmm. that I am part of you is in control. And then you just go back to it. Yeah. And it's, it's training the horse. Training the horse. And there is no perfection. Right. That's very important to realize. It's not like, oh, now hit it. You're just doing the work every day, just doing the work, doing the work. And it compounds. And before you know it, it's running on its own. And then you're doing it, digging the, that, that groove deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, um, and that's all, all, really all it is. And there's no failure either. If you're doing the work, you're succeeding. Mm-hmm. You're doing the groove. You're doing the groove. Every day you're adding. Every day you're adding. And before you know it, it works. Yeah. So then the next practice is doing it in the mirror. Mm-hmm. And this is something that you know I've experienced. Obviously, psychedelic medicine has been a big part of my life, as it, as it has been yours and, and a lot of people listening. I've found i think probably accidentally a long time ago you know just going to the bathroom on a heavy dose of psilocybin and uh-huh. looking in the mirror and i felt like i got to meet my true self i got to see who i truly am and it's a really powerful thing even looking at yourself through the eyes of love and through the eyes of truth see the animal see the see the self and overwhelmingly that's always been a really impactful experience i end up saying like oh hi like hi like i'm sorry i always say i'm sorry <laughs> it's like oh, i'm sorry that i don't see you i'm yeah, sorry that i don't yeah, see you like yeah. true self you know i'm sorry that i don't love you i'm sorry that i don't you know that i'm blind to the truth of who you are you know but it's always just met with that's love and return man. that's absolutely beautiful yeah it's it's we a very do, we should do that every day Right, I'm gonna do that every day. That's beautiful. That's <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. It's, uh, it's a reminder. It's a really good reminder, and I think your practice of doing that can get you there without the necessity for psychedelic medicine because you're in there, and I've done this too. In there, and just looking at yourself, and you're breathing in and doing the "I love myself" practice, and then you start to see the layers of delusion, the clouds, the fog that's actually keeping us from seeing the light that's within, that's always within. It just starts to dissipate. You know, and then you start to see yourself and then you can be like, oh, hi, like there you are, authentic being, (laughs) you know, and that can be a really, really powerful experience. Yeah, especially when you look in your eyes, you know, like the windows to the soul. It's when you really just see your own true self, your own true power. And when you get past the judgments of looking at yourself, you know, because otherwise, if you look yourself in the mirror... I mean, I'm always finding faults or this or that or what I could make, sure. what could be better. But if you go to the eyes, there's a purity there. 
Yeah. You bypass all this and you really connect with yourself, but also with your physical self. You know, it, it does something. This is a great one for self-confidence because mm-hmm. you're getting in touch with yourself, but also your physical self. Mm-hmm. You'll, um, I notice my self-confidence just goes up naturally when I do this regularly. Yeah. Yeah, because your true personal power, and this is not like power, like a president has power, or like a general has power. It's not power for power's sake, but your personal power is the authentic expression of the truth of who you are. And when you tap into that, you have an abundance of confidence because the truth of who you are is the most powerful part of all of us that's within all of us. The real power is within. It's not without. Exactly. Yeah, the other one is a cheap surrogate for the actual true personal power of recognition of who we are and really looking into our into our soul through the windows, like you said, the eyes, is a huge part of that. So those three things, I think, the breaths, the meditation, and the mirror practice, like that's those are the layered steps. But there's another a really critical step that I think is uh that precedes Mm -hmm. some of this and that's the forgiveness practice yeah because if you don't feel like you deserve to love yourself you're gonna have a hell of a time loving yourself you can still do it but forgiving yourself is really important yeah it's actually not something i did in the beginning Mm. um it's something i came up with later and i realized i needed to do that and you know i'm a big believer in everything starts from within if you want to love others, love yourself first. If you want to forgive others, forgive yourself first. You can't set others free without you free, freeing yourself first. You know, so it's a, and I'm someone who's always just working on his mind and trying to figure out how to be better, how to be better. And I just came up with this little practice of how to forgive myself, and it and it worked. And again, it was a very simple thing. A lot of it's actually just a metaphor, where you, <clears throat> and and i realized look if i'm going to create a practice out of it that i'm going to share with others as i do in the book then here's how you do it you know before you start everything first forgive yourself let go of the past mm-hmm. and now you can step in the future by making your vow and then doing the practice and the self forgiveness was very simple i was living in california and i drove out in my car uh to this uh, pescadero which is a beautiful lighthouse there in northern california you know ocean over there and hiked out to the to the water and I just sat there and I pulled out my journal and, um, and I wrote down, I forgive myself, but I wrote down, I, for everything I was holding against myself, I forgive myself for, wrote it. I forgive myself for, wrote it, felt it, wrote it, felt it, wrote it, felt it, wrote it, felt it until I was done. And then I actually made myself, I read it out loud again and again to feel the weight of what I was carrying. When you realize the feel, when you feel the weight of what you've been carrying, all the unnecessary garbage, you want to drop it. You're like, I don't want this anymore, right? And there's something about writing with a pen on paper. There's a power in there. There's a declaration there. So I did that again and again until I was ready to let go. Then I just hiked out to the ocean and then ball it up and just give it over. Give it over to bigger than me. Whatever's bigger than me, just take it. Mm. You know, because that can handle it. I can't, but that can. Sure. Right? And it does. And then I realized... This is the perfect time to write the vow. Because I, I, I recommit to myself occasionally, sure. right? And this is the perfect time to write the vow. I've just let go of the past. Let me create my future. So let me write a vow to love myself and the way I'm going to love myself in the future. And then set out to do it. So it's like a, it was a beautiful little transition. And, and I think it just took what I had done before to such a great level that now... Anytime I write down the vow, I first I do the self-forgiveness exercise. Mm. And you don't need to go by an ocean or anything. You can throw in the toilet in the garbage. You can burn, burn it. You can burn it. Yeah. You know, you can do whatever you want. It's the intention. You're letting go. You're giving it over. You know, I actually last time I did it, I think I threw it in the garbage disposal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Done, yeah. gone. Like I've yeah. given it over. I've dropped the weight. Yeah. Time to actually fly. And I think for people who are thinking, oh, I don't, I'm not holding anything against myself. Try it. Yeah. <laughs> Give <laughs> it a down, second. Sit down and write. Give it a second. Down, yeah. Because there's, you know, there's a lot of things that we're still judging ourselves for. And if we've judged ourselves, anytime we judge ourselves, and who doesn't judge themselves? When we judge ourselves, the judge demands retribution. It's just the way it works. Judgment demands retribution. It demands some way to balance that, what 
Mark Manson calls a moral gap. So if we're holding something against ourselves, we're going to be subtly punishing ourselves in some way, which m- probably is the withholding of our own love for ourselves. Yeah. That's the way that we create the retribution for the things that we're holding against ourselves. So you got to go through. And, and then there's a lot of shit there, always. And you're not, you, you may not get it all on the first go round. <laughs> and as you're about to throw it into the fire, like I remember I did this last, last week, I was about to throw it in the fire and I was like, oh, no, 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 hold on. <laughs> I got to get a few more things on there first. You know, and I'm sure the next time, again, it's a practice. It's not a magical thing where you put it on the paper and this is a a traditional ceremony called the despacho where you release something like that and a lot of mystical and and, uh, plant medicine traditions have this ceremony. But it's not like it's it's magical where it just you do it once and And it's good for and you're done forever. No, this is a forgiveness practice. Writing down your forgiveness, feeling your forgiveness, letting it go into the water, into the fire, into wherever you need to need to let it go. Yeah, in fact, you know, I'm thinking of something right now. Your book has inspired me uh, on your day, you know, has inspired me to actually, I do this more like um, on a monthly basis, but almost like to to take that month and then almost to add to it a daily basis of daily recommitments Mm -hmm. that I started doing. That's actually for me personally, it's taken it to a higher level. And I'm almost wondering if I should, in the morning as part of my ritual, I should do a mini forgive myself every morning for anything I hold myself that day and start that day with that. Yeah, I might just try that. That just came up, actually. Yeah, yeah. and it doesn't take too long. Oh How my long god, does it take to write down a few things. We spend more time, <laughs> you know, watching garbage on YouTube, right? Yeah, than sure. than actually literally freeing ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, got to put ourselves first. Yeah. So, I want to go into and, and, well. There's there's one thing that I definitely want to come back to is a lot of things happen to us that are not fully, if we're looking at it from a a third-party perspective, maybe not fully from the normal worldview, our responsibility. You know, Mm -hmm. we didn't cause these things to happen. You had some very traumatic things happen in your childhood. But Mm -hmm. nonetheless, there's still some, typically some kind of shame and some kind Mm -hmm. of guilt for the abuse that you received that you still need to forgive yourself for. And even if someone, you know, you went through a really heart-wrenching separation that you talk about in this book too there's elements of that even though it wasn't your choice right there's elements of that that you still have to forgive yourself for and that's what you mentioned earlier that i said i wanted to footnote and come back to which is taking that kind of radical responsibility for even even if you had just the subtlest metaphysical participation in this thing forgiving yourself and absolving yourself completely with forgiveness from whatever that situation was you know, it's something I've come to really believe. And I think I thank the child that I was who went through whatever he did because somewhere along the way he decided no matter what, he was not going to be a victim. Mm. And look, I went through stuff that I could literally point to and say victim, 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 right? And But look, that doesn't that holds me back. But if I decide I want to be the hero, like what do I do? I take whatever is there and I own it. And I let go, you know, it's like, like whatever happened, happened, but whatever's left from it, whatever the emotional charge or what I'm carrying with it, that's mine. You know, like, it's not like someone gave me that emotional charge. I created that emotional charge. Mm-hmm. And so I'm the one who's got to free myself. And if I free myself, I become the hero of that story. <laughs> that's simple, man. I can be the hero of any story in my life. All I got to mm-hmm. do is free myself. And the only one who can free me is me. You know, only we can be the heroes of our stories, you know, and it's something that it's, and it's makes, it's made me better by taking responsibility for everything in my life. And when I say responsibility for everything in my life, I mean everything internal. You know, I I really believe everything starts with the internal and goes to the external. So I take responsibility for every single thing, every single feeling, every single emotion, every single thing that happens inside. You know, I was reading, um, this guy, uh, this Christian mystic earlier this year, Neville Goddard, and I came across a quote, and he said, uh, God acts, the devil reacts. Hmm. So if you think about it, you can either choose to act or react, mm-hmm. right? And that's where actually the, that line is on where do you want to be the victim or the hero? Yeah. If we choose, make a conscious choice and act, I'm going to free myself and I'm going to let this go. 
you're acting. If you're reacting, reacting is almost often pain. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's giving away your sovereignty. It's giving away your personal power. Your it's power. Allowing... And to who? To <laughs> that's the thing. To to who? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's the most ridiculous thing, right? Yeah. It's all. It's been ours all along. Yeah. It's only ours. It's our foundation. We just have to get back to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's, and I think you mentioned this in the book as well. It's shifting your orientation from things are happening to me to realizing that you're happening to things by your own choices yeah. of your own attitude. As like Victor Frankl says, the last of the human freedoms is our ability to choose our attitude towards any given situation. Like it's you taking back control. He was in fucking Auschwitz. Oh my God, yeah. You know, like yeah. if he's in Auschwitz and he's taking control of his attitude, he's happening to Auschwitz as much as Auschwitz is happening to him. And that's what saved him. That's what saved that him. That attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, a huge, like a huge peace but doesn't mean that shit's going to be easy because (laughs) you know like things are still going to be hard so these are all these tools but then you talk about you mentioned rug flip day (laughs) yeah rug flip day rug flip day and i really i really identify i mean i really felt you on this because i've had periods of deep heartbreak i went into some of my own last night over dinner but rug flip day talk to us about rug flip day and this was so you'd already established some of your self-love practice and you know you were kind of thinking, ah, oh, maybe I'm doing pretty good. But then rug flip day happened, and it was like a second dark night of the soul. It really was. And in all honesty, looking back, and I talk about here, I wasn't loving myself. I'd gotten lazy. Mm. And that's one of the biggest, that might be the biggest lesson here, is like once you start doing something, any work, any internal work, don't coast. Yeah. Coast is when we just all humans, we get, we get comfortable, we get lazy. You know, it's just a natural thing. If you're, if you have plenty in the environment, you're not going to go out and hunt every day. You know, you just get fat and lazy, right? And the mind gets fat and lazy and I got fat and lazy and I just kind of like internally and I just kind of like took it for granted and I stopped doing everything. And the guy who wrote and talked about it is the one who wasn't doing it. And look what happened. <laughs> you yeah. know, like I am a human being and I am going to fall apart like, like a human being. And we all have our things that get to us. And I was with someone I loved more than anything. And out of, out of the blue, boom, rug flip. I come back from a tip and sh- she said, welcome. You took an overnight flight. Tell the story like a poet. Oh, you, took an overnight, <laughs> you took an overnight flight because you missed her so dearly and you wanted to see her and surprise her in the early morning. And you go back in, your heart's full of love and you're ready to embrace the one that you truly loved, your sweetheart. And she says, I don't want to be with you anymore. And other, and other things that went along with it. And I felt like, uh, you know, the rug I was standing, you know, if you're standing on a rug and someone just takes it and goes, Foop! Yep. and you're just flipping in there because you have no control. And you're just like, oh my God, I'm going to hit that ground. I'm going to shatter. That was rug flip day. And that showed me very quickly with my emotions and then my thoughts and where I went. Dude, you're not loving yourself. You're quite the, you're, you've, 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 you've gone way from it. Mm. and um, what it also gave me was I had to save myself all over again, and I had to go at this and do this again, and I felt so much shame and guilt and stupidity because, like, the things that were coming up, the way I was feeling, the way I was reacting, you know, God acts, the devil reacts. I was reacting. I was in full reacting mode, pain, this, that, emotion, rather than saying, hey, you know, like, rather than just being a man, and say, look, this is who I am. If you don't, if you want to be this, great. If you don't want to be this, that's your choice. Mm-hmm. You know, but like, this is who I am to you. I'm taking a stand for you, right? But the rest, that's up to you. You know, that's what I would have done, but I didn't because I wasn't loving myself. Sure. And I fell apart. You know, I literally just came apart at the scenes. This was a deep, deep, and still is. I still feel that. It's a deep love. And, you know, I think often... We don't talk in society the level of love men can feel. You mm-hmm. know, we don't talk about this. It's deep, man. We'll give our lives for someone. Yeah, that's a real love. That's a level of love that men have. You know, and um, and I fell apart, and I had to be- go back, kind of quite ashamed to my own self practice, which I've written about, talked about, and which is actually literally save people's life and do it from this from realize I had to do it from scratch. Because I've really fallen hard. And again, it was like, will this work? 
every time I ask myself, will this work? There's a part of me is like, maybe it won't work this time. <laughs> you know, like I'm always like a little scared. Like maybe last time, last five times were a fluke. Maybe, yeah, maybe I got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe yeah. I've just gone too far. And you know what? It worked. Yeah. And it was hard because I fought it because I felt so ashamed. I felt mm-hmm. so ashamed that I should have known. So better. you were still holding something against yeah. yourself. Oh yeah, which big was time. really slowing down your ability to feel yeah. love because you were the retribution you were giving yourself was the withdrawal yeah. of your own love from yourself. Yeah. So you had to overcome that. Yeah, and then ultimately I had to do the self forgiveness exercise, and when I did that, that helped. Yeah. Right, and then this is a guy who knows what to do, who's done this many times before. That's the human condition. We know what to do. We get fat and lazy, and then life's you know smacks you. Tell me. Okay. I mean, shit. I'm the you know. I'm talking. I've been talking about this stuff for years, and I still fuck it up <laughs> all the time. You, you know, know, that's the that's the that is exactly the human condition. But it's how quickly you can acknowledge it, and how quickly you can apply the tools that you have to get back on track to being you. To being you. You know, to being your real self. Ultimately, I think that's the best thing we can do. To get back to who we are, this state, this 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 loving, amazing human being that we are on the inside, and living life from that place, doesn't mean pain won't happen. Doesn't mean everything will go our way. But who? But then we become who we are to that situation, and that's all. That's the best we can do. It's the best yeah. we can do. Yeah. And the best we can do is the best we can do. Do your best. I was in that deep meditation I told you, and uh, and when I I had a kind of a a download from source, let's say, and the download was I asked, you know, how do you bring the authentic self, our divine self, into the human form? How can we do this? And the response was, do your best. <laughs> you know, do your best. That was the advice from <laughs> the was, universe. Your like, mom could have told you that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, just fucking do your best. You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to be able to be perfect. You know, this idea of perfection is something that really holds us back. And do your best is a moment by moment, day by day thing. Yeah. You know, and it's actually when I did Iboga that one time where Iboga, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everyone, beats the living crap out of you. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had these questions written down and then, and I somehow remember those questions, every question and got the same, same answer, be your best self be your best that's literally the answer i was like i went through all of this for that i was i could have written this to myself (laughs) but it was like it comes down to do the work you know there's no like go here make a left make a right make you know just do the work every day get up do the work be your best be your best be your best and every day you'll fall short in some some things you will do well and forgive those the faster you forgive those the deeper you forgive those the faster you'll move forward and you know if you're forgiving yourself you know what's funny is well i found that forgiveness for others almost becomes irrelevant when you forgive yourself Mm -hmm. it's just you naturally let it go whatever you were holding against them you just naturally do it yeah yeah you love yourself you forgive yourself then all any kind of thing that you would need to forgive someone for which is some emotional feeling yeah that that thing is gone and so it's like yeah of course you're forgiven (laughs) you know like you know you may not want to associate with them anymore you may want to have the discretion and the boundary to say like okay yeah you like stole money from me like we're not going to do business together anymore obviously and we're probably not going to be friends but you're forgiven because i'm not holding any feeling that requires me to demand some you know pound of flesh from your emotional body anymore you know like it's all good because i'm not holding anything against you because i don't feel anything anymore yeah the money's gone whatever but like or whatever the situation i'm hypothesizing some kind of situation like that but there could be a million things that you need to forgive someone for but as long as you're not holding something internally well it's easy to forgive after that you know something i learned very clearly after myself when i first started to like really do the self-love practice you know i had a company fall apart because of a wrong partner we'd chosen you know in business that happens and Mm -hmm. i remember and this was a very wealthy person. And, you know, it, so I, at first I had a lot of resentment. But after I did the self-love thing, I remember we met up like maybe a year later. And I remember seeing this guy and all I did was I felt sorry for him. I realized mm. like there's nothing to hold against it. I just felt sorry for him. The state of mind he was in, where he was just still angry and scrounging for pennies We had when he had so much, where I was just like, I was feeling so good inside. And I was like, this guy is legitimately wealthy, right? And flies private, private islands, this, that, blah, blah, blah. But you couldn't pay me whatever you wanted to be inside his head. 
Mm. I'd rather be inside me. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's priceless, man. Yeah. When you choose, I'd rather be inside me. That is uh, that is priceless, and we can all be there. That is the best gift. It is. Nothing that's even loving comes yourself. Close. That's nothing, loving yourself. Nothing even comes close. Yeah. Another cool part of this is this this journey was is um, you were fortunate to ha- to be friends with uh, Jersey and and Yella Grigoric. Is that how you pronounce yeah. her last name? Yeah. And there are some you well you can tell the story about them, but they kind of helped guide you on uh, like a personal fitness strength program that was actually kind of a part of your healing. Yeah, you know, I'm a huge believer in fitness, right? I, I love working out. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, you know, like when you go to the, I think Henry Rollins talks about how the weight is the, pure, like when you go to the gym, weight is the purest thing because 45 pounds will always be 45 pounds. Mm. You're the one who changes relative to it, right? It's fixed. Yeah. So if One of you, the very few things that's yeah, fixed in so the universe. You, so if you get weaker, the 45 pounds will, will get heavier. You know, it'll yeah. stay stable and you're the one who changes according to it. Oh, wow, that's great. And they are they're these wonderful Polish immigrants from Poland who's, who fled with the solidarity movements. You know, their friends were killed. And, um, you know, they're trained Olympic athletes. They're trained athletes. They're, you know, um, former Olympic athletes. And they taught me about power and working out, you know. And, you know, one of the things I've also learned when you're going through a hard time is don't just focus on the mind. Go for the body as well because mm-hmm. we are animals. Mm-hmm. We are physical animals. There's something about pushing the body when you're not go- when you're not in a good place that gets you out of you, yeah. you know. And you know, whether it could be endorphins or whatever you want to call it, but it gets you out of you. It makes you realize you're also a physical animal walking around with other physical animals, yeah. and and it breaks you from that that thing in your head. And um, yeah, so so when I I was going through this hard time, and I just met and I'm hanging out with them, and and just listening to their wisdom, you know, and and these are people who really live. I, my favorite people are people who live their values. They live what they believe. They live what they talk about. And Jersey, you know, he talks about philosophy, and he says, "My philosophy is one word: improve." <laughs> that's it. And when you meet the man, you realize that's it. He mm-hmm. really lives it. And he says, "If you want to see someone's philosophy, look at their life." That's their philosophy, not what they talk about. Look at their life, because we're all living our philosophy. Mm. So that's actually a good way to figure out what your philosophy is. If you uh, look at how your life is, and if you don't like it, you got to change your philosophy because you got to change your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because all of your, even if it's you think you have a philosophy, but you don't have the commitment to stick to your philosophy, well, then not being committed is part of your philosophy, obviously, and you have to reconcile that part of your philosophy. You know what I mean? Like, like whatever it is, like you have to recognize you are living your philosophy. So you could be like, ah, oh, philosophically, I'm this, but okay, then what parts of your philosophy are allowing you to not live that? You know, because that is your philosophy too. It's either a lack of commitment, a lack of dedication, a fear. You know, like my philosophy is I, I should do a cold plunge every day. Well, are you? You know, and if not, what is it? You know, is it, are you? not able to push yourself past the resistance it says "Ooh, it's cold you know if your philosophy is i want to be physically fit is it that part of you that's like i'm lazy is it your philosophy to just give in to those voices is that your philosophy or is it not your philosophy well your actions will show you (laughs) yeah it's a good it's a very good way to be real with yourself look at your life and that'll tell you what your philosophy is and then then as you change you can either change your life or you can change your philosophy and either way it's the same. Yeah, yeah. It's the same. And he had you actually lifting. He was like, lift heavy stuff, man. Yeah. That was basically like the simplest, the simplest way to describe what Just he said. Just power through. Just lift heavy stuff. Which, Put yourself under like a real load, which will actually lighten the mental emotional load that you're going through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's something fun fundamentally primal about lifting at least for for myself you know just just going all out sprinting lifting heavy it just it recalibrates your mind and body you know sometimes you need to be an animal and in our modern day society we, we don't get to do that and i think we lose something very important if we don't let to experience our animal self something inside is unsettled and i think working out hard is one of the best ways to do it absolutely i, I know you know, one of my favorite things about wintertime in Austin is it's not my favorite season, but I love the fact that my pool is really cold. And 
I have a really cold pool. I have a cold plunge in my garage too, but I have a really cold pool and I have goggles and I can jump in the pool and swim laps in like a 50 some degree pool. And if I swim five hard laps, sprinted laps in the pool, in the cold, I do not feel anywhere near what I felt like two minutes <laughs> before yeah. that, right? It is like three minutes, whatever. I don't know how long it takes me to swim five laps, but if I swim as hard as I can, you know, so I'm panting, you know, out of breath, just giving it everything I can, a sprint, uh, not just like casually swimming laps because it's cold and, you know, you'll feel the head rush of the water, you know, the cold will have an effect, but the sprinting will also have an effect. And no matter what I'm feeling, it's going to be a dramatic improvement on the other side of that five laps in that cold pool. And that's always waiting there. And sometimes I'll be just hum drumming around the house and I'll look at the pool and I'll look at the pool and like, oh man, go do it. <laughs> just go do it already. You know, just feel better already. And Simple things, man. Yeah. It's the very, it's the basics, you know, get cold, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, move hard. Yeah. Breathe deep. Yeah. Love yourself. Love yourself. <laughs> <laughs> very, it's the simple things. Yeah, um, that's something I've learned, man. In life, the best things, uh, this best writing is simple. The best theorems and math- mathematics are simple. Everything when you the get that mystical truths. Simple. Simple, like what did Ram Dass's teacher say? Be here now. Love everyone. Tell the truth. That's what Ram Dass oh. says. Be here now. So Maharaji said, "Love everyone. Tell the truth." That was it. That was his advice. And then, you know, one of the greatest teachers of our time took that and spent his life working on doing that. <laughs> Love everyone, including yourself, and tell the truth. Okay, go. <laughs> you know, not easy. Not easy, but yeah. simple. Yeah. But really, really simple. Living it is the work. Mm-hmm. And all these things, you know, it's the day-to-day work. Living it, that's the work. Yeah. So for you in your life, now you're going through, oh, you also had a really, this is kind of interesting, <laughs> you really had a really r- random and unbelievable medical thing happened to you which was just kind of one of those recent curveballs i remember reading in a book that pat riley wrote he talked about lightning striking like every once in a while lightning just strikes you know a player Complete gets freak, injured yeah. it's just a freakish thing that happened like my car accident yeah and like this experience you had so fill people in on that because that was a that was a wild a wild yeah. curveball that the universe <laughs> Not when I need it, I would say. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. You weren't asking for that. <laughs> no, I, I'm still recovering from it, actually. Uh, this was a little over two months ago where I was basically almost dead on an operating table. I went in for elective surgery, and it went fine. And they were fixing um, old injuries, some arteries that had gotten clogged, like smushed together. And next morning as I'm getting ready to be checked out, one of the arteries I worked on, the stitches, came apart and the whole thing burst. And f- at first, I didn't know what was going on. I was complaining to the nurses that I was in immense pain. And just th- they just thought I was trying to get more pain meds, and she didn't pay me any attention. And it, the blood came out so fast, I pulled up like a soccer ball inside my uh, my lower abdomen. And then it was so much pressure, burst out. So I want people to understand this. and Because when, when I heard this story yesterday at dinner, I was like, burst out. So it like it like burst through the sutures from the old accident, and you're like, no, no, that's not what happened. No, it's like an oil well. Like it the pressure burst, built up so much, it bursts out of flesh. It burst through your skin. Through, through, the, through the fascia, through the skin, and started spraying everyone. Then I got their attention. <laughs> 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 yeah. Literally, there's no better way to get attention from a medical staff in a hospital than spray blood on them. <laughs> 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 and all of a sudden, we're talking complete mayhem, screaming, running around, and like, I remember one resident coming and putting his hands down and trying to just this this Bellagio fountain of blood that was coming out, trying to hold it down. Or now they might as well put the music on. You know, it was insane. <laughs> and and what's interesting is we were talking about this because we've done you and I have done enough plant medicine to understand surrender, right, and to understand what happens when you truly let go. Well, in trauma, like it's different. Yeah. It's like your primal brain kicks in. There's nothing pleasant. There's no, there was no DMT <laughs> release, man. I'll tell you that. There was nothing. This is love. You know, like, there was none of that. It was horror. It was like your brain's <laughs> yeah. not designed to see blood shooting out of your body. It's just not. It goes into, this must stop. And if it doesn't, it just has to shut off, right? Uh-huh. And 
I got very lucky, like immediately. The fact that I was in a hospital is the only thing that saved me. They told me like afterwards, multiple different surgeons worked on me. If I'd walked out of the hospital, I was in Uber, I was at home, or even if I was taken somewhere, they said that would have been a one-way street. It, that was lucky that this happened right before I was being discharged. Very interesting timing, right? Mm -hmm. And they just had a patient come into one of the ORs, and this is in a big hospital in New York City, and they just threw that person out, wheeled me in. They're wheeling me in, calling in other surgeons. There's a whole team coming in. And and they will put me in the operating table. And I've been on an operating table just 12 hours before. And operating rooms are strange places, man. Yeah. They're just these weird, strange uh, places. And I'm watching, you know, like people in these um, red scrubs running around, pulling out instruments. And something in me at this point, now I've sprayed a lot of blood. I mean, think about it, soccer ball built up size. That's a lot of blood, spraying blood. We're not designed to hold that much. We don't have that much blood to get, uh, to get rid of, right, before we go. And I could feel myself, things in me like starting to shut down, shut down, shut down. And then it went to like these primal emotions of... It was just primal emotions, images, love, fear, love, fear, love, fear. It was that's all it was. It was just like going boom, 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 like in front of my face. You know, the woman I love, fear, not being, not, her not being there, fear, love, this, that, and just like. And I remember the um, the anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist came and she tried to talk to me because I think I was kind of like moving around. I was holding on to things. You kind of like an animal kind of mode, just sure. like survival, and. And she said, telling me what she's going to do. And I just grabbed, I just like, she was trying to put an oxygen mask on me and I just ripped it off. And I was just like, look, I don't know why. I just had to say something. I was like, I'm scared. I had to just tell someone what I was feeling. And I've mm -hmm. never felt fear like that. It was like a primal, like, this is it. And, and then I didn't see, but I felt it. She had these these kind of really cool funky glasses and she, she was wearing these golden dangling earrings and then the whole scrubs and the mask and everything. And she held my hand, and it was soft. And something in me thought, okay, all right. I started to relax. And then my brain kicked in again, like the back, you know, like, the, the, sorry, the neurotex, the neurocortex, which is the front, kicked in. And something in my back of my head said, thought, looked around at all this mayhem and quiet. And I mean, there's screaming happening, but I, I'm inside is quiet. And what a shitty, messy way to go. <laughs> And I was just felt sadness about it. Like, a, what a shitty, messy way to go. And then, I don't know where this came from, I gave into it. Yeah. And I, I remember giving into it and just dropping back. And it was like the, the image that I have, I don't know if my mind put it in later or then. They hadn't put the anesthesia in yet. You know, they were trying to just restrain me at the time. Um, it was like falling back into an ocean, like dark ocean, just slow motion and just letting go. And I let go to that, like, okay. I remember actually looking back thinking, if this is it, this is it. And if it's shitty, messy, this is it. And to surrender to that. It was like the ultimate surrender, you know? That, but it wasn't thinking, it was just doing. And then that was it. And then I fell back. And then, then they were able to, like, you know, restrain me and put the IV in me and everything, give me anesthesia and put me out. And boy, it was that messy. Yeah. For sure. Wouldn't recommend it. No, it's not, not an <laughs> ideal situation. It reminds me of something, right now I was having a conversation here uh, with my good friend and ally, Eric, who's sitting over there, and we were talking about the nature of God and the nature of the divine source, whatever. God has a lot of words, you know, a lot of associations with the word, but I'm comfortable using the word God. And we were talking about how God is the all color, the all sound, the all vibration, the all everything. It's everything. So... Well, the color that represents all colors is black, right? Really? Like, so all oh. colors combined is black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to lay back into the blackness, into the ocean of blackness, God's color is black. It's the all color. Lay back That's into beautiful. God. I didn't thank you for telling me that. Yeah. And it's an interesting way to look at it because you think, oh, what's God's color? I don't know, blue or white. It's the light. It's, oh, no, no, it's, it's all colors. It's every single color that could ever be, every hue from every palette, from everything, all combined into one. At the unicity, God is black. It's, it's everything. And so that laying into the blackness is really, I think, an interesting way to reframe our understanding of the divine. You really just helped me there. Thank you. you know? <laughs> of course. I've actually been thinking, because obviously I'm still healing and recovering from that experience, and 
I'll tell you, man, like, you know, I sound like a broken record sometimes to people, but like this love yourself stuff, it really works because when I came to, now I'd been through severe trauma, right? And I had to heal from that. I'd gone for, I was supposed to be in the hospital for a day and I was getting out early because I was doing so well. And now I was in there for a while. Fortunately, they fixed what broke. Because, you know, I'd, one thing I also remember telling the surgeon is don't make me have gone through this for nothing. <laughs> like mm -hmm. fix what I came in for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So, but then I was in the hospital, like in very, very helpless, vulnerable place, unable to move in insane amounts of pain, right? Just level up narcotics, which are off the charts, but still insane amount of pain. And I, my mind could have gone to why? Could have gone to the victim mode, you know, like, and I remember there were moments it would start to, and I would just go to the practice because I was like, through this, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm not going to let it layer, layer, um, like victim into me. I'm going to mm -hmm. come, I'm going to come out of this, the hero of this, you know, I'm going to come out of this better than I was before. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to start with the foundation. So I was doing that damn self-love practice through the narcotics, through the all the all the pain, lying in the hospital, unable to walk, and then being able to walk, and then getting out of the hospital, all that. I was doing this. And it worked, man. It really, really helped. Where I was actually, half the time, I'm lying in the hospital bed, feeling grateful, naturally. That was arising. Why? Because I was doing this. Mm. When really, if I hadn't, honestly, I don't think I would have been feeling grateful. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, it's these great tests actually reveal what's at the deepest layers to a certain degree. I remember, you know, in when I got in my car accident, I knew immediately, like, for, like there was one of the very interesting things is, is I get in victim mode all the time. Like I'll get in victim mode over some trivial thing that happens in business or some trivial thing that happens in a relationship. Like, oh, why, oh, oh. but this thing where I just blacked mm -hmm. out in the middle of a car ride and crashed into a guardrail, the guardrail malfunction, I split my face open, woke up in the hospital and just completely covered in blood. I remember there was not a single moment where I didn't believe that it happened for me. I didn't know why yet. I was like, and I remember saying that to, to Whitney who was there and to everybody in my family who came is like, hey, I, I know this happened for me. I just don't know why yet, but I know it. And I, I felt just, I felt Beautiful. that confidence from that very moment. Like I'll figure it out, Yeah. but I don't know yeah. why. I don't, just don't know why, but I, I know it happened for me. And, and I stuck and I was able to keep that through the whole healing journey of the process. Actually, it got harder. It got harder like when I was mostly healed. And then, then the victim mode would come in a little bit stronger when like, cause I still can't feel certain parts of my face. I still like can't, you know, there's things that are permanent damaged, permanent nerve damage. And they did a great job repairing a lot of the superficial stuff. But I'd be like, oh man, like I can't, I'm never gonna feel my front teeth again. It's always gonna be weird biting an apple or, you know, chewing something is a different experience now because my teeth are dead. My front teeth are dead. So there's no feeling and it's like I'm wearing dentures in those things, but teeth are gonna stay in because it didn't pull them out or anything, but they're dead. There's no sensation there. So it would be little moments like that where I'd be like, oh man, like why'd that have to happen, blah, blah, blah. But that came way later. In the trauma of the thing, it was like absolute confidence. This happened for me. But then the little nagging stuff where I didn't have that force of resistance to really force me to the deepest truths, then my mind would wander into the victim mode. But it's interesting, like in those times where you're really tested, that's where you really get to know yourself. Yeah, that is the truth. That yeah. is the truth. And I know, you know, my having dealt, done the self of practice on and off for the years definitely contributed to that. The work you've done contributed to the state. It's totally. when you test it, man. Mm -hmm. You know, you, show, you see what you're made of, yeah. Yeah, and then it's, you know, going about trying to choose those tests so that the universe doesn't bring those tests. Yeah, I'm to tired of those, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> choose different ones, you yeah. know. Choose the test of going to the gym. Choose the test if you're called to it of the plant medicine. Choose the test of the sweat lodge. Choose the test of going up against yourself in meditation. Choose these other little challenges rather than waiting for some lightning strike to come because it may come may come or may not come, but you'll be more prepared for that moment the more work that you put in on the front end. And look, we, when we do any of these, right, we're we're better. Fundamentally, that's the best we can do is get better on the inside. 
you know, and go through life that way and always continue to be better and better and better. That's the best you can do, as you were told. Yeah. Yeah. So where where to from here, man? Where to from here? I know you mentioned yesterday you're in this kind of healing mode and, and you're just really being patient with yourself and allowing yourself kind of to gracefully step into the unknown. Yeah, it's that's kind of don't have a choice. And maybe that's the gift I've been given. You know, I was telling you... Um, when I got out of the hospital, um, you know, so I was still in the same amount of pain. And the doc, the, one of the surgeons told me, if anyone qualifies for narcotics, it's you. Mm-hmm. You know, like you have two multiple surgeries, one of them where they literally have to go and slash me open, you know, to just get at and, and save me. And um, I was on narcotics for a week and I just, I went off, for, I went off from cold because I was, I got the, I was proof, I had the proofs for the book and I had to go through, you know, and I'm obsessive about writing, like every comma matters, every word matters. If it's the word doesn't, it's not important if I remove it. And I had to go through them. And I couldn't go through it with narcotics, at least give it what I needed. So like I had something bigger than me, mm. something that was more important than me. So like I just went off them and I was, in, I was sitting there sweating in pain and going over proofs word by word, right? And, I, and I'm getting better and most of the pain is gone. It's still there, but you know, it gets better and better. And my thing is this book... Like I survived, I, you know, I'd, I've written something special. I've shared something special that matters. And I almost left the planet without seeing it out. And now I've been given the gift of being here to see it out. So I, I owe it to that. I owe it, this book is bigger than me. So uh, that's, that's my thing right now is just like, as I'm healing, I'm being patient with myself, you know, letting myself just recover and have a lot of recovery time. But it's like when I can get out and share this book and share this book and share this book. That's it for now. And that's what every hero needs, really. You know, that thing that's greater than themselves. And, that, and we talked about that as well. Like, really, in every movie, in every epic, epic tale, having that thing that you care about and love that's greater than your own selfish needs is an essential part of being the hero of your own story. And it's like, oh, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to die. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to do this, yes, for myself, but also because there's something much greater than myself that I'm serving. Yeah, it's it's a gift, man. Yeah. That's it. So if you don't if you're out there and you don't know that you have something greater than yourself, and, and I think a lot of us are hardwired to feel that way about our kids. And I think mm-hmm. that's why having kids is such a transformative ex- experience for so many people because it instantly taps that hardwire of, oh no, this is more important than me. I mean, you talk to most parents, they'd lay down their life for their kids in an instant. It becomes something that's immediately greater. But for those of us who don't have kids, or even if we do, having something beyond that that's always greater than yourself that you know you're serving, I mean, that's how we started this podcast before we were, we were recording, para el bien de todos, for the good of all. If that matters more than you, you know, you'll always be able to default back to being the hero. And you'll naturally step up. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, that is one of the, the best gifts you can give yourself is to find something bigger than you that, that pulls you forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, calls out the hero within because we're all heroes. You yeah. Know, as much as we want to yeah. play the victim and, and play all these other different roles, that's fine. You know, it's all good if you've done that and if you still do it, that's okay. But you're a hero. Like, don't get it twisted, everybody. Like, you are a hero. If you're listening to this right now, you are a hero. You just have to find that thing that's greater than yourself that you would not waver in your commitment to. Well said. Well said, man. Yeah. My brother, this has been amazing. It has. It it's, truly has. I'm so grateful for you, for this book, for our friendship that's blossoming, and, and just I just have so much love for your journey and, and everything you shared, man. It's, it's such a gift. No, thank you, man. It's, it's a gift to me to be here. And... Uh, just your support for this. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, everybody. Love yourself like your life depends on it. It was You wrote a, a short and hyphenated version of this that's got like went viral, had like thousands of reviews. Uh, you really expounded upon it, add some amazing personal stories, like layered in more aspects of the practice, a three-part book um, that'll be coming out the week that this podcast releases. So get it everywhere. Buy it from your bookstores. Buy it from the. Buy it from Amazon. Buy it from everywhere. Did you do the audio version of this book? I did. 
I did. Cool. I actually did it last month. I was standing. I did it standing up. I like to stand. I don't like to sit. And mm-hmm. I was in a significant amount of pain, but it was another thing, man. It was just like I had to get the words out. Yeah. You know, and it's it's funny. You go through these experiences, and you you learn what you're made of, and that also sometimes is the gift of these experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, yeah, it's a beautiful book, and it's a special book. So whoever's listening and gets it, you know, I hope it serves you. Yeah. And do the ten breaths, everybody. You listen to this podcast. Just do the 10 breaths a day, whoever yeah. you are, however much you think you love yourself, at least do that, you know, do the other stuff too, <laughs> you know, but at least, at least start there. Well, thank you, brother. Anything else you want to, uh, you want to point to or highlight or? No, I'm just grateful to be here. Thank yeah, you. Likewise. Grateful to have you. All right. So much love, everybody. Thank you so much. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to aubreymarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.